All right, good morning, everyone. We are on our class four here of spiritual warfare, class four, uh, Nephilim, Satan's genetic seed. We got Luke 17, 26 through 27. This is where we'll start. This is Jesus speaking. He said, and as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be also in the days of the son of man. He's talking about in the, the second coming of the Son of Man, the Lord Jesus, used that term to refer to himself very often. Uh, as you'll see, it's often, the, too, the term, that term Son of Man is used in the book of Enoch. And we're going to talk about the book of Enoch a little bit today. But anyway, Jesus said, and as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be also in the days of the Son of Man. They did eat, they drank, they married wives. They were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. So as it was in the days of Noah. So Jesus, you know, once he says that, then, you know, we've got to, uh, we've got to believe what he said. And so we go back to the days of Noah. And um, as we're going to see here in just a second, the book of Genesis and Genesis chapter six talks about angelic beings called the sons of God, the, that type of angels having relations with human women and producing a race of giants, of half-breeds. Now, this is a statue, a well-known statue. It's in the museum here. So you see there's an angel uh, trying to seduce or taking hold of a human woman. Um, this is pretty well known and accepted throughout the world that this happened. It's amazing that many Christians deny this. Uh, but this uh, sculpture is by uh, Daniel Chester French called the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair. This is the Cocoran Gallery of Art, Washington, D.C. So you get to see that there. Obviously, somebody believes that this uh, Genesis 6 is actually real, actually true, means what it says. <laughs> All right, but here's Genesis 6, 1 and 2. Uh, and it came to pass that when men began to multiply on the face of the earth and the daughters were born unto them, and that the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. That's pretty clear there. And it goes on to say, verse 4, there were giants in the earth in those days and also after that. And that's an important phrase to understand. He says, those days, what days? He's talking about in the days of Noah. He says, there were giants in the earth in those days and also after that. So even after the days of Noah, it appears that the DNA, the genetics of the giants continued on probably through one of Noah's son's wives is what we is one theory about that, how that how it came to pass after the flood, after they were all destroyed. But anyway, it says there were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men, which were of old men of renown. So um, I think, you know, we've heard the the stuff about the, um, it, it's funny because a lot of theologians, a lot of pastors, a lot of seminaries, a lot of churches will teach that this was just the sons of Seth, basically just regular humans. And, 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 and why it doesn't even make sense that it was just regular humans, you know, um, because Seth was the righteous seed. He was the restoration after Abel was murdered by Cain. How, why would the righteous seed and the daughters of Adam and Eve all of a sudden have these mutant giants, some of which, as we'll see, reached 36 feet tall. How do you, how do, you do that? No, it's obvious here that there was something else going on. And the ancient world and all of the history and legends of cultures throughout history talk about half humans, half God, God-like beings that had superhuman strength, sometimes six fingers, six toes, the Bible talks about that, but also um, extremely large and tall. 
Um, so again, I think the Seth idea that it was just the sons of God were just the normal men and normal women. If you have normal men and normal women, you're going to get normal men and women, you know, male and female offspring. So it doesn't even make sense. And it's not what we see in the Bible and it's not what history tells us. In fact, we, we see that uh, this is revealed, the men of renown or the men of legends. Again, this goes down through history. In every culture, there is stories told of giants and that's why they're called men of renown because the legends went on for thousands of years. Uh, we see also giants depicted in ancient uh, you know, engravings and inscriptions. Here you see some Babylonian. It's obvious that the king, the one in control, is much larger. There on the right, and you see this, these normal-sized men here fighting this monstrous human-like, but yet obviously very different than us being there. So ancient artifacts and archaeology, ancient stories. Uh, here's another artifact is the King Gilgamesh holding a lion like we would hold a house cat. <laughs> Look at that right there. It's my, little, it's my little kitty. That had to be a very large... I mean... I just recently, you know, when we did a class last week, I just looked up, recently looked up lions and they average around 450 to 500 pounds. So he's just holding on to one with one arm there. Shows you something now, doesn't it? And it's interesting because see the lion, it is a lion because it's got a mane and the big paws. People say, oh, that's, that doesn't mean that. Well, I mean, looks like it to me. You can choose. But again, when things agree with what the scriptures say and they corroborate the, what the bible says why would we think it was be false why would we think it would be uh, deception and of course we see these anomalies these we're going to talk more about these toward the end of this but the abnormal skulls found all over the earth these elongated skulls and of course we've we've seen that you know some tribes in different parts of the world have you know constricted infants heads to try to create this but again what were they what were they mocking or what were they trying to recreate? It's obviously something that they thought was different and powerful and, you know, either a legend or a representative of their gods. But as we'll see later on, that um, there's a difference you can tell between a human skull that's been manipulated and, and these boys here, because there's different, uh, the plates of the, the skull are, are very different. And it's not by manipulation. You, you wouldn't change how the plates and the suture lines would be just by, you know, constricting the head. So, and also they've tested the DNA on these and found that they're not fully human. But we'll talk about that too in a minute. <laughs> Here's Job 38, 4 through 7. Very important. Because remember, Genesis 6. He said the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair. Here's a proof going back into the Old Testament. And I believe Job was written before Genesis. Basically, I believe Job was written by Job. And then later on comes Moses and God takes him up on the mountain and shows him, shows him what happened in the past and gives him the story of what happened in the ancient past. But here we see... The Lord speaking to Job very clearly. In fact, Job 38 is the Lord himself speaking directly to Job. And he says, Where wast thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare, if thou hast understanding, who hath laid the measures thereof? If thou knowest, who hath stretched the line upon it? Whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened? And who laid the cornerstone thereof when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted, for joy. Now this cannot be mankind because this is talking about the very beginning of creation when God laid the foundations of the earth. Before he made man, he said the morning stars sang together and the sons of God shouted for joy. So these are the angels. And we talked about angels last week and the fallen angels. And we talked about the different 
uh, types of angels. So some are referred to as stars. Some are referred to as the sons of God. Some are called cherubim, seraphim, on down the line. So uh, called, some of them are called flames of fire. Job 1.6, you see this also. It says, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord and Satan came also among them. All right. And this was a private conversation at the throne of God about Job. And so the sons of God, again, is a reference to angels. And some of these angels rebelled against God's plan and his will and followed Satan and also made this change here. So let's look at the definition of the word. I, I don't even know why some people that teach and preach on giants will just be, are adamantly say, oh, it's not Nephilim, it's Raphaim. And, and I'm like, well, the word giants here, which the giants are the offspring of the fallen angels, the sons of God. So they are the offspring. The giants are the offspring of the fallen angels, sons of God, and human women. And they're called Nephil. All right? And that's how you say it, Nephil. Or plural, Nephilim is how it's pronounced. Nephil, Nephilim. And here's what's interesting about this. I just, I don't know why I didn't pay attention to this last time I did this, but I didn't really focus on this, but it says here, a feller. Now that's not a Southern phrase for, hey, that feller over there. All right. A feller means someone who cuts down trees, but we'll get to that in a second. A feller, that is a bully, a tyrant, a giant. So here's the Strong's Hebrew lexicon definition. A feller, a bully, a tyrant, a giant, so a mighty man, all right? Now let's keep going here. We'll look at this, the etymology of this word in English here, feller, all right? Notice the first definition of the word feller. What does it say right there? A person who fells trees, a lumberjack. So it cuts trees down. Now why, why are these guys talked about cut, referred to as giants who cut down trees? A machine for felling or cutting down trees. This is interesting, right? Well, you know, the Bible does talk about great trees back in the day. And um, here's a, a verse from Daniel. We'll read this right here. Uh, of course, it says many, this article said many ancient religious traditions from all around the world tell of giant trees with their existence even being mentioned in the Bible. Daniel 4.11, the tree grew large and strong and its top touched the sky. It was visible to the ends of the earth. Now that had to be a very tall tree. It goes on to say in the Norse, Yadastril, the world tree, which stood at the center of the world as the Axis Mundi, the Aryan Vedas contain detailed description of massive and majestic trees. And the writer of this article goes on to say, which leads me to think that maybe there was not just one yard to shill or drasil or however you say that yagdashil, uh, but perhaps many giant trees with each one serving as a home for each tribe of people, along with other flora and fauna that uh, a tree of life would support. In addition to religious and esoteric traditions, there are also popular culture references to trees popping up in movies, TV shows and books. And that is true. But, you know, I do believe there was a video that came out uh, a few, you know, a couple of years ago and I did watch it. And the more I see some of these odd looking rocks, mountain tops and mesas, and I mean, they do look like trees. They do look like petrified, just large petrified tree stumps. But notice it appears like almost in every picture, see, as if they were just like the, the, the tree on the right, the tree stump on the right. It looks like they were sawed off, cut down. Do the giants have something to do with cutting down these massive trees? Maybe they, they did cut down some of them to build large houses for themselves. I don't know. Palaces. There were things that went on.
back in these days that we just don't know about. But that right there, well, I mean, we've, we've discovered it's pretty clear. I mean, look at that. Now, the, now what the, the geologists will tell us in modern science is that, you know, these were pushed up, that magma in the Earth's core pushed these up, or you know, tectonic plates pushing together, pushing these up. But look at that right there. It pushes up a perfect column. Yeah, Josiah just said liquid doesn't push up. Exactly. Nor, I mean, in, I mean, you could see where you say you can make an argument. Well, maybe, you know, a hill could be pushed up. But that? Nah. I don't believe that at all. Right? <laughs> I just don't believe. So that's in Venezuela. Um, let's keep going here. Um, just, I mean, look at that. You know, just the jagged edges sometimes of a tree that might have broken off, fell down. And then was underwater all of a sudden and got infused with all kind of miner minerals and was petrified. I think it very well could be. And look, look, here's uh, this. I can't remember now where this one is, but this is a big, makes it looks like. But look, this is this is a petrified tree right here on the right. This is a big mountain rock mesa. This tree trunk uh, was two and a half miles across. The tree could have been 10 miles into the sky if that was its base. Now, did we just read in Daniel there was a tree that went high up into the sky and could be seen from the ends of the earth? Isn't it interesting? But again, doesn't it look like it was cut off? Perfectly. I mean, almost like, like a perfect level almost. Looks like a big, gigantic, you know, saw took that down, doesn't it? <laughs> All right, look at there. Look at that little mountainside there. What does that look like? And beside it there is another little petrified tree. That, that on the right used to be wood, used to be a tree. Now it's a rock. This is real. But again, what does that look like up there? Does it look like... Looks like it was cut down, sawed off. There's some more petrified trees. Turned to complete stone. Now there's Devil's Tower up there in the left corner. Famous place. What is it in Arizona, New Mexico? Where is it? Why, not, why am I forgetting? But look at the stump to the right. Tree stump. Is it just me? Are we crazy? What's interesting is look how it gets down here. I started looking up cypress last night. I was looking up, started looking up cypress stumps. Look at how they come down. These down here on the bottom, these are cypress tree stumps. Now look, look at this. Here's what's interesting. Zechariah 11, 2. This is in the Amplified Bible. Wail, O cypress, for the cedar has fallen because the magnificent trees have been destroyed. Wail, O oaks of Bashan. Now, what's interesting about that is Bashan, who lived in Bashan? We'll find out in a minute. King Og, one of the last of the giants. It was known as the land of the giants. The land of the Raphaim. Land of the giants. Wail, O oaks of Bashan, for the inaccessible forest on the steep mountainside has come down. So here's a, here's a scripture in, in a prophet's book in the Bible saying that the magnificent trees have been destroyed. Another translation even says the stately trees have been destroyed. Huh. Now who destroyed them? Again, look at there, Devil's Tower. Look at the cypress trees. That look interesting. Isn't it interesting that the Lord, let me back up again. He mentions the Cyprus. And then why would they name this place the Devil's Tower? Why does the devil claim it? I don't see anything devil about it. <laughs> but let's keep going. Look at that one. Look, those are Cyprus. That's a pretty big Cyprus uh, tree there on the left. Stump, I guess you should say tree stump. And then here we go in China. This was recently found footprint. 
That's a little big. That would be what? That looks like, say, maybe about three times the size of that normal man right there. I mean, I would say you could say, well, two maybe lengthwise, but then you got to deal with the width as well. So I'm saying this guy was probably between 12 and 18 feet tall, whoever made that footprint right there. <laughs> Pretty wild. And then here's the article, giant footprint. Of course, they'll admit stories and tales about gigantic beings inhabiting the earth occur in almost all ancient cultures and civilizations, but we don't know. We don't know. We don't know if we want to accept it. You know why they don't want to accept it? Because, again, it would prove the Bible to be true and accurate. And this is another one of those things. Again, this aspect proves that the Bible is not, that this, this story, these stories of these giants, that this is not myths and legends. The Bible is to be taken literally unless we are told specifically it's to be a parable or a figurative uh, language or an allegory, just like Paul talked about. He, you know, Galatians 4, he talked about the allegory of the two covenants. He told us, hey, I'm, I'm giving you an allegory here. Jesus said, I'm telling you a parable here. Uh, otherwise, stuff about creation, historical events, these are to be taken literally. And we find the evidence of these things. We find the evidence of, of these large, the Bible talks about these large trees, the evidence talks, the Bible talks about these large giants, and then we find footprints and bones, and we find this evidence everywhere. Now let's go back, remember he said that they were men of renown. So let's look up the word renown here. This is the word in Hebrew. It's interesting because uh, the, the word, the Hebrew word there uses the shin or the sheen and the mem. And of course, I know what those letters mean. Of course, the, the shin is the teeth or consuming or devouring. And you'll see that, that uh, Enoch talks about them devouring mankind. So they're called the men of renown, the devouring ones of chaos. The meme is the word for, for mem of the word is for uh, letters for water or the waters of chaos. Can mean the waters of life, but when it pertaining to these giants, you would say, the devouring ones that cause chaos, all right? Um, it's interesting, it says here that these, uh, this word men of renown here, through the idea of a definite and conspicuous position, an appellation as a mark, a memorial of individuality, um, honor, authority, character, base, fame, so report. So, these things, these were so, what it's saying here is these things were so uh, massive and well-known and intimidating and such a, such a big part of history. That's why they're talked about in every culture and ancient civilization. All right. They, that's why it's men of renown, fame, report. It continued to be reported and talked about. And we'll see that. It's only recent years, you know, that the government of the United States and other governments of the world that became Luciferian, satanic, uh, truly beginning to follow Satan's plan, begin to hide the evidence of this because again, they want to hide anything that proves the Bible to be true. So they hide the bones of these things, but let's look at Enoch. Now, let me just say this about the book of Enoch. I do not put Enoch on the same level as the 66 books of the canon, okay? But this is a fact. Let me just give you some facts about Enoch, and this is true. Enoch is quoted word for word by Jude, and in fact, almost in the first chapter of Enoch. Now, Enoch 1 is what we're talking about here. Not Enoch 2 or 3. There are forgeries. There are medieval forgeries. But the book of Enoch was discovered in the Dead Sea Scrolls. There's a book of Enoch. So dating back to at least 100 BC and even going back to Dead Sea Scrolls, some of them as far as 300 BC. Now, when you have a book like that, that was clearly in existence before Jesus appears on the scene, before God becomes flesh and comes on the scene. When you have a book clearly known by Jesus, 
And we see things that he quoted in. Do you still, you have my phone? Let me, let me just read this. This was sent to me by my, my brother Chad here. And he made these statements about, about Enoch. So before we go any further, let's, let's just read this because I, I, well, actually Chad posted this. He said, did Jesus and his two half brothers, James and Jude, quote from Enoch? Enoch one. The answer is yes. Uh, Jesus, James, and Jude all quoted from Enoch 1. Both were the half-brothers of Jesus. They spent more time with Jesus than his apostles. These are the two of his half-brothers that grew up with him. And it says, um, Jude went so far as to quote an entire paragraph verbatim when they discovered the Dead Sea Scrolls in Cave 1 of Qumran. Enoch 1 was among them and dated to 300 B.C. All right. Proving beyond a shadow of a doubt they existed before Jesus and the fact that Jesus was familiar with it along with his two half-brothers speaks volumes. Um, lastly, Jude was under the divine Holy Spirit in, and, and when he wrote his epistle, which included a paragraph of Enoch 1 verbatim. Now listen, here, here's, here's some other places where it appears that Jesus did quote from that. Now listen to this. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. That's Matthew 5, 5, right? Here's Enoch 5, 7, or 6, 9. The elect shall possess light, joy, and peace. They shall inherit the earth, right? Here's another one. The father judges no man, but hath committed all judgment unto the son. John 5, 22. Enoch 69, 27 says here the principal part of the judgment was assigned to him, the Son of Man. Isn't that interesting? The Son of Man in the book of Enoch is referred to as the Messiah. Matthew 19, 29 says they shall inherit everlasting life. Oh, shit. And then Enoch 49 says those who will inherit eternal life. Uh, Luke 6, 24 says, Woe unto you that are rich, for you have received your consolation. Enoch 94.8 or 93.7, depending on what translation you use. Woe to you who are rich, for in your riches have you trusted, but from your, your riches you shall be, uh, but from your, you, your riches shall be removed. Um, Matthew 19.28, Jesus speaking to the disciples, he says, you, shall, you also shall sit upon 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Enoch 108.12, I will place each of them on a throne of glory. And it just goes on and on. He talks about, Jesus said in Luke 16.26, um, there's a great gulf fixed between us and you, talking about between paradise and hell, Hades, the, the underworld, the two parts of the underworld. One was paradise, one was the place of torment and punishment. Um, that's Luke 16.26. So it says, and then Enoch 22, 9 and 11 says, by a chasm are their souls separated. <laughs> right? In my father's house are many mansions, Jesus said. Enoch 45, 3. In that day shall the elect one sit upon a throne of glory and shall choose their conditions in countless habitations. And it just goes on and on and on. So there, there, and there's many more. But here's what Jude quoted. Jude quoted Jude 1, 14 and 15, quoting Enoch 1, 9. And Enoch, also the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment upon all, to convince all them that are ungodly, among them of all their ungodly deeds, which they have ungodly committed, and of all their hard speeches, which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. Now, having said that, there are some issues with the book of Enoch. I think we've lost some things in translation because of it being so old and ancient. And so again, you just, you, it's, it's the old saying that you would do with any book, with any history book, with any book not in the canon of scripture, what would you do? You would read it. If anything contradicted the Bible or you weren't sure of, you would spit that out. But if it corroborated, if it agreed, if it confirmed. So here we have a very, very ancient book found in the Dead Sea Scrolls dating back to 300 BC, not a medieval forgery of some, you know, monk in a monastery somewhere, a Roman Catholic monk in a monastery, saying some things that obviously 
the Lord and his two half brothers who later became apostles and um, that they took seriously. Um, and it's pretty sure we're pretty sure there's other quotations in the New Testament from the book of Enoch. But let's just read this. Enoch chapter six. This is in accordance with Genesis six. But he says this. And it came to pass when the children of men had multiplied, that in those days were born unto them beautiful and comely daughters. And the angels, the children of heaven, or as they're referred to, the sons of God, as we prove that in Scripture, so this confirms Scripture, saw and lusted after them, and said one to another, Come, let us choose us wives from among the children of men, and beget us children. And Simjaza, who was their leader, said unto them, I fear ye will not uh, indeed agree to do this deed, and I alone shall have to pay the penalty of a great sin. So they knew they were sinning. They knew this was forbidden. They knew this was a big problem. So these angels, they all agreed, this group of angels, it wasn't all the angels, but they all answered him and said, let us swear an oath and all bind ourselves by mutual imprecations, not to abandon this plan, but to do this thing. Then swear they all together and bound themselves by mutual imprecations upon it. And they were all 200. So there were 200 angels, not all the angels, but this group of 200 who descended in the days of Jared on the summit of Mount Hermon. So he tells you where it happened, Mount Hermon. And they called it Mount Hermon because they had sworn and bound themselves by mutual imprecations upon it. So they had sworn an oath to do this thing. Now let's keep reading. He tells us a little more about this. Again, it does not contradict Scripture. So if it doesn't contradict Scripture, and this is a very ancient book that was well-respected, by Jesus and the apostles, then I think we should respect it and at least glean maybe some information and understanding from it. But again, he says here, this is Enoch chapter seven, and all the others together with them took unto themselves wives and each chose for himself one and they began to go in unto them and to defile themselves with them. And they taught them these women charms and enchantments and the cutting of roots and made them acquainted with plants. And they became pregnant and they bear great giants whose height was 3,000 L's. Now, this is right here is in great debate. I don't think anybody knows for sure what an L is. I've heard different arguments about this. This could be part of a mistranslation. We don't know, but we do know some of these things. You know, we know some of them were nine feet. Some of them were, you know, 12 to 15 feet. I mean, we know from different stories, but again, I don't know what an L is. Uh, but he goes on to say, who consumed all, now listen, this is important, this part here, who consumed all the acquisitions of men, and when men could no longer sustain them, the giants turned against them and devoured mankind. So it appears they became like cannibals and destructive, right? And they began to sin against birds and beasts and reptiles and fish and devour one another's flesh and drink the blood. And then the earth laid accusation against the lawless ones. So this is not, again, far off at all um, from what, what does the Bible say? In fact, let's go back. Um, and I don't have a slide for this. Let's just, uh, just, just turn in your Bibles with me. I'll, I'll just read it. But we go back to Genesis 6. Because I did not put these verses up. But here, Genesis 6, he says this. is interesting. After he talks about these giants, Verse four, he says, um, and there were giants in the earth in those days after that. And, and also after that, when the sons of God came into the daughters of men and they bear children to them, the same became mighty men, which are of old men of renown. And look at what verse five says in Genesis six, five says, and God saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man um yeah he repented the lord he had made man on the earth and it grieved him at his heart and um and look at verse 13 if you go down to verse 13 well verse 12 and it says uh oh right here verse 11 we'll back up and the earth also was corrupt before god and the earth was filled with violence so would that I don't see Enoch 
contradicting this. The earth was filled with violence, right? And God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. And the Lord God, and God said to Noah, the end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them, and behold, I will destroy them with the earth. So, again, it doesn't violate the book of Enoch. Now, notice it says here, remember in the book of Enoch, that they made, they descended upon Mount Hermon and made an oath. Well, not only do we have this from the book of Enoch, an ancient book found in the Dead Sea Scrolls, but we have an archaeological discovery that confirms it. Let's look at it. Um, this is Mount Hermon. Uh, it's called the Mountain of Snow, they used to call it. This is in Israel. But Mount Hermon, and I just entitled it, those who take an oath proceed from here. There's a sacred building made of hewn blocks of stone on the summit of Mount Hermon, known as the Kosar Antar. It was the highest temple of the ancient world, sitting at 2,814 feet above sea level. It was documented by Sir Charles Warren in 1869. Warren described the temple as a rectangular building sitting on an oval stone plateau without roof. He removed a limestone stele from the northwest of the oval, broke it in two pieces, and carried it down the mountain and back to the British Museum where it currently resides. An inscription on the stele was translated by George Nicholsburg to read, According to the command of the greatest and holy God, those who take an oath proceed from here. So here, this ancient inscription from an ancient high place, Mount Hermon, refers back to this place of satanic, evil, pagan worship. They say, those who take an oath proceed from here. Basically, it all started here. The oath. And, and why is this important? It all started here. This is the war we're in. We're in a war against Satan and his genetic seed, these Nephilim. And they have been at war with us since then. And it's always been about wiping out humanity and also trying to overthrow God. And they think they're going to do it when Jesus returns as well. But there you have that. Let's look at it here. Now, here's the Jewish virtual library encyclopedia, Mount Hermon. So here's another source, right? Starts talking about Mount Hermon in Psalm 83, Psalm 40, uh, uh, Song of Solomon 413 called Hermon, the highest mountain in Israel range, Lebanon, Syria. After the six day war, it became into Israel's possession. Uh, Mount Hermon dominates the surroundings. It's an impressive peak visible from a distance of more than 60 miles, which, uh, there's your flat earth proof right there. When somebody do the calculations, let's see 60 miles, 2,814 feet, 60 miles. Uh, yeah, shouldn't be able to see it. But there you have it. I'll have to check this one out. <laughs> I'll have to do the math on this one later, but I can tell you. Either you shouldn't be able to see it, or you should only be able to see just the very tip top of it. But we'll talk about that later. That's another story. But... So here in this heading, in this article, the Jewish Virtual Library, right, Mount Hermon, which goes on to talk about Mount Hermon down here. The Bible praises the dew of Hermon. We're down toward the end. It's lions, it's cypresses. And then says this, a Greek inscription found near the peak states that only those who had taken the oath were allowed to continue from there. Those who took the oath. Who was that? Those angels, right? Those 200 angels who took the... And isn't it interesting that Freemasonry is all about oaths? Making oaths. Uh, again, here's a view of Mount Hermon. This article says, this is where the Nephilim giants that Moses and Joshua defeated in the Old Testament lived. Later, uh, where David slew one of their close cousins named Goliath. 
although hard to fathom. The Bible lists over 30 verses about giants. In Numbers 21, 21 through 35, and Deuteronomy 3, 1 through 11, Moses mentions Mount Hermon in relation to the conquest of Og, king of Bashan, and Sihon, king of Heshbon. These were both Rephaim, Hebrew for giants. Og's bed frame was said to be over 13 feet long, Deuteronomy 3.11. The territory of these two giant kings was on the east side of Mount Hermon, as listed in Deuteronomy 1, 1 through 5. Bashan went from Gilead on its southern border to Mount Hermon in the north, and Heshbon was south of Bashan in Moabite territory. Now, this is very important here. I have it in blue down here at the bottom. In New Testament times, it was at Mount Hermon's base that Jesus came with his disciples to Caesarea Philippi for a special messianic revelation. Now, Jesus did nothing by accident. So he goes, and let's look at it, to Caesarea Philippi. Do you see this up here? And I'm just going to circle it. Jesus took his disciples. They journeyed up to Caesarea Philippi. What is Caesarea Philippi right next to? Mount Hermon. Now, if Mount Hermon could be seen from 60 miles away, do you think that you could see it from Caesarea Philippi? Right? So this was the backdrop where Jesus said this, Matthew 16, 13 through 17. Let's read it. When Jesus came into the coast of where? Caesarea Philippi. So right at the base of Mount Hermon, right in view of Mount Hermon. And Mount Hermon was so, so huge. There's no way you could miss it. So Jesus was giving them this picture. And guess what? His disciples probably knew the story from Genesis and from Enoch about the giants and about Mount Hermon. So they were probably well familiar with it. So Jesus is he's giving them an illustrated sermon. Why? Because what is he revealing here? He's revealing what is going to defeat Satan's power and the power of Satan's offspring, these giants? Him. The revelation of who he is. His blood on the cross. His blood shed for our sins to break the power of Satan. But look what it says. When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples saying, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, Some say that thou art John the Baptist. Some Elias and others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He saith unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. So Jesus is, is revealed to them. Supernaturally, it's revealed to them that he is the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of the living God. God manifested in the flesh. That's revealed because uh, Isaiah 9, 6 said the Son would be also be called the mighty God, the everlasting Father. And the government would be upon his shoulders. All right? Now look, just so you see, look at that right there. There's Mount Hermon. You want to talk about a city at the base of Mount Hermon. There it is. I just zoomed in on that for you. All right? Now this passage goes on to say, not only the revelation of who Jesus is as the Christ, as the Messiah who would die for the sins of mankind, the one who would come and crush the head of the serpent, Satan, destroy his power. Jesus says this again, this has all happened at the base of Mount Hermon. He says, and I say also unto thee that thou art Peter. And upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. You hear him talking about Satan's kingdom and Satan's basically his work in the earth was built with an oath from the rock of Mount Hermon. Do you see the parallel Jesus is pulling here? But he says, Peter, you're just a little stone. You're a, you're a Petros, you're a pebble, but I'm the rock. And upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell, the gates, the authority, the power, what allows them to work in this world. A gate is a, is a doorway or an authority, right? Permission. You either get allowed in a gate or, or not. 
who says, The gates of hell shall not prevail against it, and I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in the heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in the heaven. So here, at the base of Mount Hermon, where this whole thing took place, Jesus reveals who He is, and He reveals that He's going to build a church and give it power and the gates of hell with Mount Hermon as his backdrop will not prevail against the church. They're going to try, but they won't prevail. It is also believed, and I can't prove this 100%, but it is believed by most that this was also the mountain where Jesus went and was transfigured and Moses and Elijah appeared talking with him about what he was going to accomplish through his death on the cross and his resurrection from the dead. But we'll get into that later. But let's keep going here. Here's some of the sizes of these Nephilim, these giants mentioned both in the Bible and found you know, in more recent years. It says here, these skeletal figures represent just a few giant human remains unearthed and documented in historical records along with the historical accounts of Goliath who had three brothers as big as he, Og, king of Bashan, whose bed was 13 and a half feet long, and Max Minus Thras, a Caesar of Rome. I, you know, I'd never heard of him until I started looking at this last night. I don't know how I missed it, but here you have your six foot present day man, average, really average height for a man. That was about 5'10", 5 5'11". 5 Let's say six foot. Then you had uh, this guy found, this 15 foot guy found in Turkey in the 1950s. Max Ministras, the Caesar of Rome, was at least eight and a half feet tall, though I think he was bigger by some of the descriptions, but we're going to look at him in a second. Um, Goliath is saying 10 and a half, but if you go by the cubits, he was between nine and a half and 11 feet at least. Og was at least 12 feet, maybe more uh, tall. Um, here's a 19 and a half foot found in 1577 AD under an overturned oak tree in, uh, what does it say? Can in, uh, I can't even read that. Luc Lucine, I think that's in France. Another one found in France, 23 feet. Found in 1456 beside a river in Valence. Uh, here was 25 and a half feet found in 1613, France near the castle of Chaumont near the capital, near, nearly a complete skeleton, 25 and a half feet, found in 1613. Think about it, two years after the 1611 King James, that's discovered. In Europe, not far, you know, England and France are really close to each other. And then here we have 650 BC to 640. This one was uncovered to an earthquake 36 feet. I can't even imagine that. That's that's like our telephone poles out here. I think they're what, 36, 40 feet high? Or is it more than that, these telephone poles out here? Anyway, let's keep going. So here's Maximinus or Maximinus Thras or the Thracian. He was only Roman Emperor Caesar for a short period. But he's the only one that came up through the military, through the Roman legions, and actually became Caesar. Here's some descriptions of him. This is quite wild because, again, this is taken from secular history. Roman, I put Roman emperor giant. This is from Wikipedia here. But just some of these phrases. Um, ancient sources ranging from the unreliable Historia Augusta to accounts of Herodian speak of Maximinus as a man of significantly, significantly greater size than his contemporary. Now they say one of these historians is, is not accurate or not trustworthy, but then they quote two, but then, I don't know, again, whoever wrote this, but this is interesting because it says here, his thumb was said to be so large that he wore his wife's bracelet as a ring for it. Now, I'm going to tell you, they tried to say that this guy was just eight and a half feet tall. But, but if, if 
if his thumb is the biggest a woman's wrist, <laughs> just his thumb, this dude was huge. And it goes on to talk about him a little bit more here. It says, he was of such size, so Cordes reports, that man said he was eight foot six inches. I think he had to have been probably bigger than that. The historian Herodian, a contemporary of Maximinus, mentions him as a man of greater size, noting that he was in any case a man of such frightening appearance and colossal size that there is no obvious comparison to be drawn with any of the best trained Greek athletes or warrior elite of the barbarians. This guy must have been a terror to behold. Anyway, now I also find it interesting because this, I just, again, in, in Wikipedia article here, talks about his obviously great hatred for Christians because he ordered, according to early church historian Eusebius, or Eusebius, I should say, or Eusebius, I think that's right, Caesarea, We've, you, we talked about him last semester, the imperial household of Maximinus, Maximinus, I guess, predecessor Alexander, had contained many Christians. Uh, Eusebius states that hating his predecessor's household, Maximinus ordered that the leaders of the churches should be put to death. I mean, this guy was only emperor for about three years, and one of the things he did was kill all the church leaders, the Christian leaders. Sounds like he had a, some Nephilim influence in him, didn't it? And uh, this was, in this persecution, uh, Hippolytus of Rome. Um, this was the persecution of 235 AD. So, ordered by, obviously, a Nephilim Thracian emperor of Rome. At least, minimum, eight and a half feet tall, probably bigger by the descriptions, particularly of his thumb wearing a bracelet as a ring on his thumb. That guy was bigger than eight and a half feet tall. I can tell you that right now. Let's read this. This is from Deuteronomy 3.11. Made reference to this a minute ago. King Og of Bashan. He says here, this is the Bible. For only Og, king of Bashan, remained of the remnant of the giants. Behold, his bedstead was a bedstead of iron. <laughs> I mean, he couldn't have a regular bed. It had to be made of iron to hold his weight. Um, is it not in Rabbah of the children of Ammon? Nine cubits was the length thereof and four cubits the breadth thereof after the cubit of a man. So you get the picture, right? But again, it depends on the size of the cubit. Was it the 18 inch cubit? Was it the royal cubit of 22 inches? Um, that's why we have these variations. Um, but regardless, he was over 13 feet tall. Pretty big dude. And he was one of the last, the remnants of the giants. And they talk about, and when they wrote this, when, you know, is not his bed there? Over, over there. I mean, it wasn't something somebody could carry off, I imagine. <laughs> Take a, take a division of soldiers and pick the bed up and carry it off, right? Um, but here you have a picture of the king, King Og here that they carved into stone. Well, let's keep going. We got a lot to get through. And of course, there's been discoveries of tools made and a femur bone discovered Think of this, this is our friend Joe Taylor. Y'all remember Joe? But a femur bone that was, uh, what's the femur bone? It says here it is uh, 47.24 <laughs> inches long. A fe that, 48 inches is four feet. A femur bone, that's four feet. Okay, my femur bone is probably about 18 inches, right? A foot and a half. Right, so at least three times, three times to four times my size. So that would put this three times my size. I'm six foot tall. So three times would put this guy at eight 
18 feet that had this femur bone. And look at those axes there. There are axes there as big as a man. Who's swinging that axe? Not me. Not you. <laughs> right? Somebody a little bit bigger. And then there's more evidence of giant people. I mean, look at these axe heads. Look at that guy's hand. Look at these axe heads that were found. Or arrowheads. Huge. And this is in Science Daily here. Giant stone axes found in African Lake Basin. Massive. I mean, the Professor Thomas has the following to say, the biggest hand axes that anyone has ever found anywhere over 30 centimeters long. So 30 centimeters, what is it? 30 centimeters, about three centimeters an inch. So almost a foot long axe head. Just massive. Right? Now let's go back to the Bible. Well, the Word of God says, this is Numbers 13, 28 through 38. Nevertheless, the people be strong that dwell in the land. Remember, he sent out 12 spies. They came back, 10 gave a bad report, said we can't do it. Two said we can do it because God is with us. But here's their reasons why the 10 said we can't do it. Said we can't do it because, uh, yeah, truly the land's flowing with milk and honey. But they said, verse uh, 28 here, nevertheless, the people be strong that dwell in the land. And the cities are walled and very great. And moreover, we saw the children of Anak there. And the Amalekites dwell in the land of the south. And the Hittites and the Jebusites and the Amorites dwell in the mountains. And the Canaanites dwell by the sea, by the coast of Jordan. And Caleb stilled the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and possess it, for we are well able to overcome it. Now, if Caleb believed God would give them the power, the strength for victory. But the men that went up with him said, we be not able to go up against the people for they are stronger than we. So first of all, they talk about they're strong. So they have, why, would they, why would they think they're stronger? Why would you just look at somebody if they were the same size as you and think they're stronger than you? No, they'd have to be much bigger. And that's exactly what they said. It said they brought up an evil report of the land, which they had searched unto the children of Israel, saying the land through which we have gone to search it is a land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof. And all the people that we saw in it are men of great stature. And there we saw the giants, the sons of Anak, which come of the giants. And we were in our own sight as grasshoppers. So we were in their sight. Meaning, we see the difference. We look like grasshoppers. And they think we look like grasshoppers. <laughs> I would say that's a pretty vivid description. Wouldn't you? Is that Bible? Deuteronomy 2, 8 through 12. Now, there were many different people groups that were descendants of this oath of these fallen angels and human women from Genesis 6. This is Deuteronomy 2, 8 through 12. And when we passed by from our brethren, the children of Esau, which dwelt in Seir, through the way of the plain of Elath, and to Ezion Geber, I guess that's how you say it, we turned and passed by the way of the wilderness of Moab. And the Lord said unto me, Distress not the Moabites, neither contend with them in battle, for I will not give thee of their land for a possession, because I have given our unto the children of Lot for a possession. The Emines uh, dwelt therein in times past. Listen to this, a people great and many and tall as the Anakin. So here's another group, the Emines. I guess that's how you say that. It's plural, so yes, they were Ms. And M-E's, plural. But they were great people, tall as the Anakim. So the, we already found out. The Bible says the Anakims were giants. And he says, which also were accounted giants as the Anakims, but the Moabites called them Emims. The Horims also dwelt in Seir before time, but the children of Esau succeeded them when they had destroyed them from before them and dwelt in their stead, as Israel did unto the land of his possession, which the Lord gave unto them. So 
We have plenty of Bible. Here's Deuteronomy 2. Continued from verse 17, the Lord spake unto me, saying, Thou art to pass over through Ar, the coast of Moab this day, and when thou comest nigh over against the children of Ammon, distress them not, nor meddle with them, for I have, will not give thee uh, the land of the children of Ammon any possession, because I have given it unto their children of Lot for a possession. That also was accounted a land of giants. Look at that. The Bible says the word, isn't that? Land of giants. That also was accounted a land of giants. Giants dwelt therein in old time. And the Ammonites called them Zamzumines. Look at that, Zamzumines. Boy. <laughs> Man, you can make a cartoon, you know, a kid's cartoon out of this stuff, couldn't you? The Zamzumines, they're the bad people. Right? But he says the Zamzumines, a great people and many and tall as the Anakim. But the Lord destroyed them before them and they succeeded them and dwelt in their stead. So again, the Bible talks about this over and over again, these giants and that the Israelites had to go into the land. Some of them had been wiped out, but some of them remained, many of them, in fact. And so they had to go into the battle. And of course, you know, we're talking about this being biblical. Again, why, why any pastor or church would shy away from talking about this i don't get because it, it's just it's pretty well established all over the bible david and goliath first samuel 17 i mean there's no, no need to repeat that story i mean it goes on through samuel talking about men who the you know so a minute ago one of the articles said that goliath had um three brothers but don't no, he had four and later on david's mighty men killed killed them some people say that's why David picked up five stones out of the brook because he wasn't ready just for Goliath. He was going to fight his four brothers if he had to. Man had some courage, didn't he? Now, this is an ancient place in Israel called Gigal Raphaim. Now, that's Hebrew, but it simply means the circle of the giants. You can go visit this site. In fact, I saw a video from RSE, Christian Brother. Great, does great videos. He visited this place. Uh, he believes there's still occult rituals and human sacrifices and stuff going on at this place, but this is an ancient, very, 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 very ancient. Uh, it, it's been there a long time. <laughs> anyway, let's read this. Gilgal Raphaim, the Circle of the Giants. The site is enormous. The outside circle has a diameter of 159 meters. That's close to say 100, close to 160 yards. Uh, over 37,000 tons of rock went into the construction of the complex. Two openings in the circles have been used to measure the solar solstice and the rising of Sirius in 3000 BC. So this was not just a place of the giants, and it's believed the giants built this they built it in such a way that it was astrological because again their connection to the stars some of the angels being stars fallen stars being fallen angels but again remember the israelites when they fell into witchcraft and occultism and paganism and idolatry a lot of times they were worshiping what the sun moon and the stars the host of heaven but anyway, it goes on and says, the fact remains that Israeli archaeologists are totally mystified by the Gilgal Raphaim or the Circle of the Giants. No other complex built in the Middle East resembles it, and it predates the pyramids by over 500 years. The indigenous nomads of the time did not engage in this kind of megalithic building. So outsiders were probably the builders. According to the Bible, the only outsiders living on the Golan Heights back then were giants so the circle of the giants now look at that picture really close and you're going to see where the connection begins to come alien crop circles and the circle of the giants now does something look similar there that's an alien crop circle and there's your circle of the giants you know what that is that's a signature Remember the rule. Jesus said everything done in secret, everything spoken in secret, 
is going to be shouted from the rooftops. There is nothing, he said, Jesus said, that, there is nothing hidden that shall not be revealed. So I believe Satan is under orders that, that part of the rules of the game is that he has to reveal the truth in places. But it has to be bold and it has to be out in front so everybody can see it. So this clearly, and let's go back to this slide here. This clearly is them saying that there is a connection between this, these so-called aliens that they're trying to say and the Nephilim, the giants, the descendants of the giants. And I'm just going to tell you they're one and the same. They will appear again. I'm going to show you that here in a minute. But they will say that they are aliens. And even now, I watched an episode of the Ancient Aliens on the History Channel just a few weeks ago. And I watched the episode where they tried to say that the angels who descended on Mount Hermon and created this hybrid race of giants were aliens, not fallen angels. They're just trying to make that kind of, that little bitty twist here. Very important because that's where this is headed. Remember Jesus said, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be also in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. In the days of Noah, you had the giants, the half-breeds, interacting with human beings. Right? There was interaction going on there. Wasn't good interaction for a lot of human beings. But it was going on. And so Jesus saying that means there's going to be this interaction with the giants and human beings again in the last days. Oh, it's coming. But let's keep going here. The collected works of Abraham Lincoln. This is a fact. Library of Congress. <laughs> Abraham Lincoln made this statement. He said, quote, when he was looking over, I believe he was looking over Niagara Falls. But he said, but still there is more. It calls upon the indefinite past when Columbus first sought this continent. When Christ suffered on the cross, when Moses led Israel through the Red Sea, nay, even when Adam first came from the hand of his maker, then as now Niagara was roaring here, the eyes of that species of extinct giants, listen to this, whose bones fill the mounds of America have gazed on Niagara as ours do now. Now this is a direct quote from Abraham Lincoln. Now, some have tried to say he was talking about dinosaurs. No, he wasn't talking about dinosaurs. Because it was during this time, during the 1800s and early 1900s, when the discoveries of giant human skeletons were being found, and even in mounds all over the United States. And you see that in newspaper article after newspaper article after newspaper article, Here's one, New York Times, August 10th, 1880. Was it two very tall skeletons found? The following was copied verbatim from a note made from the pocket almanac of the late Judge Attlee. So a judge wrote this. He says here, on the 24th of May, 1798, being at Hanover, York County, Pennsylvania, in company with Chief Justice McKean, Judge Byron, Mr. Bird and others on our way to Franklin and taking a view of our t of the town in company with Mr. McAllister and several other respectable inhabitants, we went to Mr. Neese's tan yard where we were shown a place uh, near the currying house from whence in digging to sink a tan vet some years before, taking two skeletons of human bodies, they lay close beside each other and measured about 11 feet, eight inches in length. The bones were entire, but on being taken up and exposed to the air, they presently crumbled and fell to pieces. Mr. McAllister and some others mentioned that they and many others had seen them. And Mr. McAllister, who is a tall man, about six feet, four inches, mentioned that the principal bone of the leg of one of them being placed by the side of his leg reached from his ankle and considerably way up his thigh, pointing a small distance below the hip bone. So here's a judge, a chief justice, and he said other honorable citizens who went and witnessed this. Um, that was in uh, York County, Pennsylvania. Uh, put 
from the Harrison, Pennsylvania Telegraph, 1880. So, you know, let's, let's go back. Abraham Lincoln was president in 1860, right? So not far after him, these things are being found. Uh, Wisconsin mound. See, notice it says mound open here. Skeleton found of a man over nine feet high with an enormous skull. Maple Creek, Wisconsin, December 19th. One of the three recently discovered mounds in this town has been open. It was found the skeleton of a man of gigantic size. The bones measured from head to foot over nine feet and were in fair state of preservation. The skull was as large as a half bushel measure. Some finely tempered rods of copper and other relics were lying near the bones. The mound from which these relics were taken is 10 feet high and 30 feet long and varies from six to eight feet in width. The two mounds of lesser size will be excavated soon. So this is New York Times, December 20th, 1897, copyright the New York Times. <laughs> this, is, this, this, this is before they were trying to hide it. This is, before they did, this is before they wanted to hide all biblical truth, right? But look, let's back up. President Lincoln was talking about the mounds. He says, the eyes of that species of extinct giants whose bones fill the mounds of America. And what did we see there? Talking about Wisconsin. Mounds being opened up. And what do we find in those mounds? The bones of giants discovered in what? Mounds. Now, why would they have these mounds? The Indians used to do that too. The Native Americans. It was a, to, to mark a burial place. It was so it could be seen. That's a burial mound. It was a memorial. It was like a putting up a headstone. So that's what Abraham Lincoln was talking about. I love how people try to make excuses for that. Oh, it's you just talking about dinosaurs. Oh, really? Yeah, the dinosaurs say, hey, let's make a trip up to uh, up to the border. Let's go up to Canada up there to New York so we can see the Niagara. <laughs> no, he was talking about, noticing he was talking about Moses, I mean, um, Abraham Lincoln was talking about Moses and Adam. He was referring back to the ancient times. He had read the Bible. He knew about the giants. So let's keep going here. Um, again, Wisconsin mound opened. Skeleton seven feet long, found in Ohio. You know, I'm not going to read all these. I mean, you can go uh, find giant Indian bones. Again, these are New York Times. May 5th, 1885, New York Times, December 20th, 1897. I mean, these are too numerous to put in here. Giant skeletons found archaeologists to send expedition to explore graveyards in New Mexico where bodies were unearthed. Los Angeles, California, owing it to the discovery of the remains of giants, a race of, look at that. I know it's kind of hard to read on this. You might can read it better on your screen there, but he says, Los Angeles, California, February 10th, owing to the discovery of the remains of a race of giants in Guadalupe, New Mexico. Uh, it just goes on and on and on to talk about forearm. Listen to this. The men who opened the grave say the forearm, a forearm was four feet long. A forearm. My forearm, maybe a little over a foot. That's a man four times my size. That's crazy. And it just goes on and on. That was, uh, that was February 11th, 1902. More recent discoveries near Serpent Mound, Ohio. The big Serpent Mound. Goodness. Relics of Indians living, you know, 700 years ago. I could have put slide after slide here's another one two human skeletons of giant size were unearthed in lakewood new york and look at that that's the state republican this is taken from the library of congress right here 
Chronicling America, Historic American Newspapers of Congress. Look at that, chroniclingamerica.loc.gov. And there you have it, from the newspaper. A thigh bone, talks about the thigh bone there being 30 inches long. 36 inches is three feet. There you have another one. What is that? State of Washington, further investigation, mounds near, uh, no, Carthage, Illinois, resulted in unearthing of hundreds of human, hundreds, do you see it? Hundreds of human skeletons of giant proportions. Hundreds. Where did they all go? Who took them? Look at there, Beaver Falls, two giant human skeletons found, gigantic size. It just goes on and on. Look, they even displayed some pictures in the newspapers back then of the huge skulls. And look, notice some weird shape skulls as well. Here's some. Cave in Mexico gives up the bones of, of an ancient race, 200 skeletons of men each above eight feet in height. New York Times, May 4th, 1908. Now people who say, oh, you're a conspiracy theorist. You talk about this, right? Well, what about all these newspapers? What about all these people finding these things all over the place? And all of a sudden, it's like all that comes to a halt and it's a hoax. Who would do that? Who would try to bury this? The satanic elite who be begin to get control of the world, they begin to get control of government, they begin to get control of the press and education. And of course, they, the Smithsonian begin to suck all these things up and bury them underground in their, you know, their vaults. Let's keep going. Of course, I mentioned this book here. Here's this guy. Again, not a Christian. Uh, and he's got one, The Ancient Giants Who Ruled America, The Missing Skeletons, and The Great Smithsonian Cover-Up. So it's a whole book written about this. The Great Smithsonian Cover-Up by Richard Dewhurst, the Emmy Award-winning writer of the HBO feature documentary, Dear America, Letters Home from Vietnam, a graduate of NYU with degrees in journalism, film, television, has written and edited the History Channel for the History Channel, the Arts and Entertainment Channel, PBS, Fox Television, Fox Films, ABC News. So here's a guy, obviously you would think, you know, on board with him. But maybe he just, uh, maybe he's not. Maybe he just decided to tell the truth. But the missing skeletons in the great Smithsonian cover, that sounds like something you'd hear coming from a Christian writer. Not a secular well-connected individual. But again, remember, maybe that was part of that they have to tell the truth. It has to come out. And it's up to us to look for it, find it, right? Now let's keep going. There are pictures like this everywhere. In order to understand the future, we must understand the past. Because see, there's nothing new under the sun. All things come around. Sometimes they get renamed, they get repackaged, but they come back around. There's giant skeletons found in Egypt. Egypt depicts giants. Shows you when they were building that. It looks like what? Giant people were helping them build that. But regular people don't go up to where that waste is. Giraffes range from 14 to 20 feet tall. Hmm. Why would you have somebody as tall as a giraffe? It's just an artiste taking license. Maybe not. Maybe he was depicting exactly what he saw. Look, he's got the little monkey hanging on to the giraffe's neck. He seems to be proportioned correctly. Right? Here's some of the blocks made for the pyramids. Now look at a normal man down there. And look at who's carrying the blocks. Hmm. Y'all see what I see? Do you see what I see? Is it? This is where it gets interesting. Now of course, this is in the old one, but I just find this fascinating. 
So here's this special little box with a little serpent on it, right? Serpent with like a dragon head or something, right? You see that? With runes. So this is ancient Norse stuff here. So here, here's a detailed view of the lid of an oaken casket containing a giant's heart. Preserved heart of a Norse giant in an oaken casket from the 5th century A.D. That was pretty wild. While going through his famous grandfather's belongings after his passing in 1937, violinist Lars Sigerson discovered this casket with its gruesome contents. It appears to have been passed from generation to generation with his and his family for hundreds of years. The explanation and whatever story that goes with it has been lost to the ages. The inscription on the casket is written in Old Norse runes and reads, Behold, within this casket lies the heart of the fierce and terrible giant known as Harunganir, slain this day by Fafred the Red, whose bravery and cunning shall live forever. <laughs> and in the casket is a large preserved heart. So there you have it. And beside it, the picture of an Irish giant that they dug up. Anyway, let's look at this right here. Now, this is very interesting. Now, they were here long ago. Has the time arrived for their return? You say their return? Yeah, and what's interesting is, does the Bible say they will return? Well, remember Jesus said as it was in the days of Noah, so will it be in the days of the coming of Son of Man. So that means, well, they'd have to reappear. And here's an interesting, if you look this up, and you can look it up in the King James and then look it up in the Hebrew, but the Septuagint translation, right? Remember the Hebrew to the Greek back in 250 BC? It's very interesting translation here of Isaiah 13. Let's look at this. Now I'm going to show you Isaiah 13 in the Septuagint version. It says the giants are going to return. And I'm going to show you where the rabbis say the same thing. Get this. They say that the giants are returning. We're going to help them. Now, once you understand where the rabbis are, that their rabbis are going to follow the Antichrist. So any giants returning to help them while they're following the Antichrist, not good, right? <laughs> well, let's read this right here. This is Isaiah 13 from BibleHub.com, the Septuagint translation. Isaiah 13, 1 through 5. And he says here, the vision which Isaiah, or Isaiah, son of Amos, saw against Babylon. Lift up a standard on the mountain of the plain. Exalt the voice to them. Beckon with the hand. Open the gates, ye rulers. Open the gates. Now, wait a minute. Open what gates? To the abyss? To the underworld? Don't we have a little picture of that? In the book of Revelation, talk about a key given to the an angel to go open the bottomless pit and let stuff come out. So he says here, open the gates. What did Jesus say at the Mount Hermon? The gates of hell will not prevail. Open the gates, new rulers. I give command and I bring them. Giants are coming to fulfill my wrath. Do you see that? Giants are coming to fulfill my wrath. Rejoicing at the same time and insulting. Isn't that kind of what Goliath did? Oh, he was rejoicing. Thought he could beat anybody, but he was insulting the armies of Israel. Sounds kind of familiar. And the, when the Lord says here, I give command, basically the Lord's going to allow it finally to happen. Now, I've, I've listened to two different people who said that they have witnessed these giants whom they are, they, that our military is claiming to be aliens, particularly in an underground base in Dulce, New Mexico. All right? Two individuals, one was killed for releasing this information, named Phil Snyder. But they're saying that these things are going to come fight. And the only thing that stops them is the name of Jesus from a true believer. That's the only thing that'll stop them. And they've told, and this one guy I was listening to last night, and I'll, I'll talk about him later 
again, my, my friend Chad Riley sent me his, the interview. <laughs> it's mind blowing. Quite the mind blowing interview, this guy. Um, allegedly a colonel in the military, had been a sniper. And um, he talks about what he saw. Uh, he, he, he basically saw the same thing that Phil Schneider saw uh, and was killed for. And he came out, you know, in the 90s about it. Um, and Phil Schneider was not a Christian. He just came out. He said, I'm telling you, there's these big, tall, massive things. They said they're saying aliens that are underground. Well, um, he was saying that uh, the guy I was listening to last night, that they tell him that the, the most high God um, has a time appointed for them to come out. They admit it. And they say the son of the most high is coming and they're going to fight him. They tell, they said they told him that. They won't say his name. <laughs> oh, they hate the name Jesus, man. They hate the name. But he says here, I give command and I will, and I bring them. Giants are coming to fulfill my wrath, rejoicing at the same time and insulting. A voice of many nations on the mountains, even like to that of many nations, a voice of kings and nations gathered together. The Lord of hosts has given a command to a warlike nation to come from a land far off. Now listen to where he says, they're going to come from a land far off. Where? From where? From the utmost foundation of heaven. Well, what heavens is he talking about? He's talking about the foundation of the firmament. Where does the firmament come down and hit the foundation of the earth? At the ends of the earth, Antarctica. That's why they're obsessed with Antarctica. They're going to come from Antarctica. I believe the elites of the world are going to Antarctica, and Antarctica is kept secret because these things are there too. But that's one of the gates. Is at different spots in Antarctica. So he says that they're going to come from a land far off, Antarctica, from the utmost foundation of heaven. The Lord and his warriors are coming to destroy all the world. Now, when it says the Lord and the Lord, he's going to cut them loose. That's kind of like he used Babylon. Remember, he used Nebuchadnezzar and Babylon. They were not righteous. They were wicked, pagans. But he said, I'm going to use Nebuchadnezzar basically as my tool to discipline and judge Israel. Well, he's going to use allow the giants to bring discipline and judgment on the earth. And then he will, like he did with Babylon, he will take it down and he will take these entities down too. This is, you say, okay, well, Pastor Dean, that's kind of crazy. All right, all right, well, maybe it is, there it is, maybe it isn't. So here's an article from breakingisraelnews.com. And it says, discovery of biblical Nephilim remains opens questions over giants roles in the end days now giants roles in the end days. who's talking like this is this guy christian no he says the nephilim were on earth in those days and afterward when the sons of god came into the daughters of men and bore them children so here you have this jewish guy july 6 2017 talk about biblical nephilim remains opens questions over giants role in the last days what so what's he referring to let's look at the article so these skeletal remains were discovered in China, point to resemblances with biblical Nephilim, right? And so the article says here, for those searching for archaeological proof that the biblical Nephilim could have existed, the findings in China may serve as a starting point. The findings are truly ancient, dating from the late Neolithic area, which ended between 3000 to 2000 BC. And notice he says BCE there, so that tells you he's Jewish not Christian. If the skeletons were from a particular tall race of people, it is reasonable to believe that similar breeds existed in other parts of the world. Archaeologists in China also found that the taller skeletons were contained in larger tombs, indicating a correlation between height and social status. So basically, the bigger the giant, the more they were honored, right? Scientists conjectured that wealthier people had access to better food, 
which would account for greater height to the scientists. It can't be biblical giants and the race of fallen angels and human women. No, it just had, they had better food. So they grew like, you know, three times bigger than normal humans. Scientists, right? <laughs> Anything but the Bible. Anything but biblical truth. Oh, it gets old, man. That's weak sauce right there. <laughs> That's complete weak. That's just... That's, people look at you and go, really? Come on, shut, just shut up. You know? <laughs> but the article gets even more interesting because here these Kabbalah satanic rabbis come on here, right? And of course, they get some things right, they get some things wrong, which blows my mind, right? All right, but let, let's read this. He says, in addition to the biblical references to this giant race of men, they figure predominantly in latter Jewish traditions. Rabbi Yosef Berger, rabbi of the tomb of King David on Mount Zion, explained that the Nephilim are not human, though their history and their fate are intertwined with those men. Well, they're not fully human, would be the correct term. They're part human, but part fallen angel and the descendants of those mixed. And then he goes on to say, the Nephilim were angels. No, they were not. See, that's where he gets it wrong. Does it say they were angels? No, it says the sons of God were with human women. The sons of God were angels. And the giants, their offspring, were that Nephilim. So he gets that wrong there. He says the Nephilim were angels that uh, were forced uh, to, that, that God was forced to send to earth as punishment. Rabbi Berger explains some of them mixed with men, and those are the ones we read about in the Bible. Rag, Rabbi Berger related a teaching from Rabbi Elijah ben Solomon Zalman, the preeminent Lithuanian Torah scholar from the 18th century known as Vilna Gaon. Uh, the Vilna Gaon connected Nephilim with the final days of, uh, of the Messiah. So I'm guessing... Don't quote me on this, but I'm, I, if I looked this guy up, I didn't have time to look him up. I just found this article last night. I would probably bet he's a Kabbalist, more than likely. But regardless, he says this Vilna Gaon connected the Nephilim with the final days, the last days, right? Quote, the guy on the Vilna wrote about another group of Nephilim who didn't mingle with man. So... So he, he creates a, a group of Nephilim that they didn't mingle with men. They're not bad. Listen to what he says about it. He said, they settled beyond the Sambation River and are hidden from us. Rabbi Berger said, according to rabbinic literature, the Sambation is the mystical river beyond which the 10 lost tribes of Israel were exiled by the Assyrian king of Shalmaneser. Now, where is this all mysticism coming? Zohar. Zohar and Talmud and Jewish occultness. This is the satanic Jew voodoo people. They just make it up crap. But look what he says down here at the, at the, the last paragraph. He's talking about these, <laughs> these good Nephilim, right? These good... <laughs> he says they observe the commandments. So they're Torah observant. <laughs> They observe the commandments and are very holy, but it is written that they are eight feet tall. Rabbi Berger said, they are truly formidable to behold. They will remain hidden until the final battle for Mount Zion, at which time they will come to help Israel in the battle. Now Israel at this point and the Jews will not be following Jesus Christ. They will be following the Antichrist. But do you hear what this rabbi is saying? In the esoteric occult, Kabbalah, Zohar, the, the Jewish mysticism, they've created good Nephilim and bad Nephilim. And there's going to be these good Nephilim that come and help us in this battle. No, one thing you're right about, they're coming. <laughs> they're coming and they're going to be involved in the battle. But if you're not on Jesus' side, you're in trouble. Right? I just, 
I found this just fascinating that they're saying the Nephilim are returning in the final days. Do you see that? Rabbis. These satanic Jewish occult rabbis know a little bit. They're still deceived about things, but they know they just the story's just twisted. Here you have 13 Nephilim skulls. So, so you see different anomalies. Now, remember, the Bible talks about some of them had six fingers and six toes. Some of them have, we've found out, double rows of teeth. Uh, some have even had horns. One feature that seems to be predominant. And again, you got to remember, your first offspring, you had fallen angels, human women, Nephilim. But then let's say you had two Nephilim. They're not fallen angels, so you start you start gradually changing the genetic makeup, right? So you start getting these different genetic anomalies, and one of them started appearing with these elongated skulls. All right, that's not I, I don't say all Nephilim had elongated skulls, but you started having different genetic anomalies. And let's just look at this. See, this is the war. We're at war with these things. And the Lord God said unto the woman, this is Genesis 3, 13 through 16. The Lord God said to the woman, what is this that thou hast done? She had disobeyed and ate the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. She said, the serpent beguiled me and I did eat. And the Lord God said unto the serpent, because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle and above every beast of the field. And upon thy belly shalt thou go and the dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed. And it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Now, this is where people like Zen Garcia and these people that are into Gnosticism and they start getting into dangerous extra biblical books like the Gospel of Thomas and Philip and the Zohar and some of this other stuff, Jewish mysticism and the Kabbalah, and they start saying, you know, Adam was created male and female. So there's your Baphomet. Um, that's in the Jewish mysticism and the Zohar and all that. And, uh, Rob Skiba's mentor. Pappy Ruckhoff teaches that Adam was male and female. And you, so you start getting this creepy land. And then, of course, Zen Garcia's serpent seed doctrine that he pushes is really old. It comes from, again, the Zohar, Jewish mysticism. It was picked up by the Gnostics in the Gospels of Thomas and Philip. But he says here, God's word does say, your seed, Satan, and her seed. So he does say there's going to be a genetic seed of the serpent, but it, does, it, had, it has nothing to do with the serpent having sexual relations with Eve and Cain being the serpent seed. No, we have it. It's the Nephilim. That's the seed of Satan. And the word seed, of course, does mean fruit, plant, so in posterity, children, and so forth. There you have it. Lexicon, the key, Hebrew, Greek. So it does refer to physical offspring. Satan would have the word zera means seed and it also refers to semen, man seed. And so therefore he is saying there will be the human race seed that's not tainted by Satan's Nephilim genetic DNA, but there will be a seed that is we see this. Here's the pre-Inca heads, and then you got the Egyptians. What did the Egyptians end up being? Enemies of what? The people of God. You got Egyptians wearing their little goofy hats to cover up their freakish skulls, and then you got their little long freaky skull-headed babies. But they're showing you they had these long head skulls, so they were Genetic, the, the Egyptians were the seed of the serpent, the mingled. And that's where you get all those, the all seeing eye. There you have more Egyptian artifacts, plainly showing you the tall one there, elongated skull. There's an Egyptian queen, Nefertiti, or Nefertiti, whatever her name was. They would wear the hats to cover up the head. 
you know, like a big old five gallon bucket hat. <laughs> five gallon bucket head, that's what we call it, five gallon bucket head. That's it. <laughs> These are found different places in the world, Peru. And here's what's important, if you see. Oh, there's one with the horns found in Israel. How'd you like to see that thing coming at you? Look at that. See, I'll let you know right there. And they're talking about even just the space in the head there. So much more space. So this shows you the different, the normal human suture and plates there of the skull, not the same in these elongated skulls. So not just manipulated. And here's what we're going to end with. DNA results for the Nephilim skulls in Peru are in, and the results are absolutely shocking. Basically, they've come down to say that there is a new human-like creature. Now, I didn't have time to find the other article last night. And this morning I was in a, in a hurry. But one of the things they said is that now they can tell that they had a human mother, but they're not sure what the father was. What does that sound like? Just like our story, doesn't it, in the Bible? But notice what he says here. The cranial volume of these elongated skulls is up to 25% larger and 60% heavier than conventional human skulls, meaning they could not have been intentionally deformed through head binding or flattening. They also contain only one parietal plate rather than two. The fact that skulls features, uh, and this, uh, the fact that the skulls features are not the result of cranial deformation means that the cause of the elongation is a mystery as it has been for decades. No, it's not a mystery. It's pretty well revealed. So DNA tests have proved this now, right? And then you got your satanic elite trying to mimic this elongated skull. Look at that. This is Katy Perry. We know she's a Satanist. She's high-level Illuminati, sold her soul to be a mouthpiece, to be an evangelist for the New World Order, for the Luciferian, to recruit people. And then she has the song E.T., you're so hypnotizing. Could you be the devil? Could you be an angel? Your touch is magnetizing, feels like I'm floating, leaves my body glowing. They say be afraid. Now she used to be a Christian, so she knows. They say, who's she talking about? Chris, be afraid. You're not like the others, futuristic lovers, different DNA. Different DNA. Who puts that in a song? A Satanist? A Luciferian elite Illuminati? Different DNA. They don't understand you. No, we understand because the Bible's told us exactly what they are. They don't understand you. You're from a whole other world, a different dimension. Yeah, the underworld. <laughs> You opened my eyes. Ah, there's that, the tree. The knowledge of good and evil. You opened my eyes and I'm ready to go. Lead me into the light. That's the light of Lucifer she's talking about. Kiss me. Infect me with your love. Fill me with your poison. Wow. Take me. Want to be a victim. <laughs> You are a mind control puppet. Want to be a victim, ready for abduction. Boy, you're an alien. You're touched so foreign. It's supernatural. It's extraterrestrial. You are so supersonic. Want to feel your power. Stun me with your lasers. Your kiss is cosmic. Every move is magic. Yeah, okay, whatever. You psycho. But again, you could be the devil could you be an angel? Wait a minute. The devil was an angel. <laughs> oh, they tell you. And then we see it played out over and over again. The city of angels. The angel wants to be with the human woman, so he has to fall. 
become like a human so he can have sexual relations with a human woman. That's what the movie's all about. 1996, I think, or 95, somewhere in that time period. Twilight. Right? Even Superman. Isn't he an alien from another planet? But he had the forbidden thing. Remember, he has to go into the chamber. You might not remember this one. This is the old Superman from the 70s, right? Had to go into the chamber and become a normal man so he could marry Lois Lane. He was in love with Lois Lane. It's all there. But notice the ancient Egyptian hieroglyphics. They depict these entities that look just like we see the aliens look that are depicted. You know, I posted this meme on Instagram, I think yesterday, the day before. There's a couple of aliens with the big, you know, the big almond looking eyes. And they're saying, you keep calling us demons. That's racist. <laughs> We keep calling you demons because you are fallen angels. You're with Satan. You're with Lucifer, the devil. But they're going to claim to be aliens from extraterrestrials from other galaxies and planets and dimensions. And they're just going to be from here, the underworld. From beneath us. And they're going to come up on the earth. Remember he says, there's, beware of those things that are going to come up, up, upon, up on the earth. Oh yeah, they're coming. But anyway, you need to understand that. And as we discover and as we'll show you, and I'll, I'll just close with this because we, we had a lot of slides today, but um, that's, that's going to be the deception is they're going to claim to be aliens. And that's part of the big, big, big thing. And there's so much more I could say, so much more we could cover, but um, that's why this is important. Number one, this is important because Jesus said, as it was in the days of Noah, so will it be in the days of the coming of son of man. So we need to be aware of this. We now see the connection of how they're connecting aliens with the Nephilim. And that's what they really are. And they're trying to cover that up the best they can, because that's going to be the part of the massive end time deception. That's, that's going to be unleashed on us. But we also need to know this also explains why God himself had the children of Israel back then wipe out entire people groups. Um, and we, you know, we talked about this last semester that he wiped out certain people groups because they weren't really fully people. They were evil. They wanted to devour and destroy mankind and God had to intervene or they would have succeeded. And part of the Satan's plan was if he could wipe out mankind or pollute mankind's DNA, then the Messiah could not become as a man to die for our sins. So that was part of the, the ultimate plan was to stop the Messiah from coming. Failed. And the next mission to try to intervene They're They're, they're, they're creating these giants, super soldiers, they're messing with everything, technology, DNA, genetic manipulation, all of it's being done to try to create the super soldiers, the X-Men, to fight the Lord Jesus Christ when he returns. So there you have it. That's part of the overall plan of spiritual warfare. But just know uh, this pretty much uh, class four here. This is going to be the end of basically the origins of all these things. And we're going to get more next week into the authority that we have as believers, binding and loosing, new covenant authority, and how to begin to use that. But you, you can use that authority and power you're given as a born again believer in Jesus against whatever the devil brings up on the earth. All right? Well, let's pray this morning. Father in heaven, we love you today. We praise you. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the truth. We thank you for the evidence throughout history that proves your word to be true. Lord, it's just, uh, I don't even understand why preachers wouldn't preach on this to 
uh, encourage and build the faith of your people, Lord, that your word is true from Genesis to Revelation, Lord. And, uh, and we thank you. We thank you for that. And I ask you to bless these students as they read and study this and prepare for their quizzes. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Class dismissed. God bless you guys.